of that, basically. Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm Joseph Nelson. I don't know a lot about wine, but I know a fair amount about data science. And so tonight I want to talk to you all about how to build a recommendation engine, specifically when you know nothing about the subject area on which you're recommending. So what are we going to cover tonight? Well, first and foremost, the lecture style that I like to give is highly interactive. So if you're sitting towards the front, I'm sorry. And secondly, the goal is to have a walk, working knowledge, takeaway, a high level of how recommendation engines work and how you can build one uh, actually yourself using Python technologies. I'll then discuss how we can do that, or how I did that with, with the team that I worked with, uh, sponsored by the French Embassy, to build a wine recommendation engine. And it's a bit of a shame that this is recorded because now they know that I don't know anything about wine. But for better or for worse, they enjoyed our, our results. So we'll talk about that. And at the end, we'll discuss some next steps, and I welcome your questions for uh, this project, other projects, and things like that. Um, before that, a bit about me and maybe why you should listen to me or maybe why you shouldn't. Uh, I live by this quote, that all models are wrong, but some are useful. And this is a George Box quote that every statistician in the room sure has heard 800 times, but it's, it's all too true. Even if you don't know that your model is correctly measuring the world, or it's wrong a lot of the time, it can still provide signal among noise, or at the very least, a heuristic in which you can identify an accurate result. So another way of saying this is don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And we've all heard that before, and it's very true in data science, that we need to fall into a analysis paralysis instead of deploying something. Just deploy. Now, a bit, a bit more about me, I mean, Jonathan, Jonathan handled this. Um, the only thing I'll add is, Things I like are hockey, software as a sales startups, bad data science drawings, and running. Uh, I think you can learn a lot about someone from their influences. So I'll touch on that for a second. I look up to Mark Andreessen and Ben Horowitz as venture capitalists in Silicon Valley. Zuckerberg is under 30, and I have to do that right. Andrew Rank, who's my favorite machine learning researcher at Stanford. Jan LeCun, who leads Facebook's artificial intelligence research team and is one of the leading authors when it comes to unsupervised learning methods. And then Jürgen Schmidova, whose stated goal since he was the age of 16 is to automate himself as a researcher. To automate his own job away so that his research area does itself. And he's an artificial intelligence researcher as well. Alright, so that's enough of that. I'm not very boring in this, or I'm pretty boring in this content, it's much better. Recommender systems. They're ubiquitous. They are, uh, most every application we open is going to have recommended content. Whether that's our Facebook news feed, our Netflix is quite obvious, but even non-obvious methods, implicit recommendations that we're receiving every single day about technologies we interact with, or even when we're going to check out. And in a physical sense, we're in the checkout aisle, and the things that are placed there are ones that are more likely to trigger us to make a buy response. Recommendations without us even noticing it. Now, a formal definition of a recommendation system, or recommender system, or recommendation engine, depends on who you're talking to. If you're talking to someone that's not into data, use the word engine, goes over much better. Recommendation engine, gotta get it. A recommender system aims to match users to products, items, brands, etc. that they likely haven't experienced yet, or predict a user's preference based on what they have experienced. So, pretty straightforward. We try to make a prediction about some, what someone is going to enjoy. And there's a number of methods that we can use to solve that exact problem, right? There's a number of models we can build and a couple of tasks we can take. But they all rely on ranking and predictions based on those rankings. And importantly, they rely on, of course, data, but more specifically, the type of data we're dealing with. And so in order to discuss how to build a recommendation engine, we equally need to discuss the types of data we're working with and how we can leverage that data to better serve the users of our given product. Now, you see a slide called data types, and you think it's going to be real, real boring. I assure you it's not. 
We'll play a game. There's two types of feedback. The first is explicit. A user is knowingly dictating the content that they seek to be offered. That's all I'm going to say for now. Implicit. A user is interacting with our application or our service, insert widget, in a way that we can derive useful insights for the purposes of recommendation. So we'll hammer, hammer down on these a bit, but that's just the preface you're going to get. Now, the next slides. It's a game. Everyone has at least two figures, so you have to play. For the following slides, I want you to put up one finger in the air if you think that the system that I've displayed here is an explicit type of data feedback or application. If you think it's implicit, put two fingers in the air. Okay? Everyone, no one can say I didn't know how to play? Got it. Yo. Implicit or explicit or implicit? I flipped the wording on you. Explicit is one. Implicit is two. Fair number of ones and a few twos. I want to hear from one of the twos. Why did you say two? Uh, well, I, I'm looking at the stars. Mm -hmm. So you're giving uh, you're giving information, but you're not exactly saying. Okay, so his argument is you're given information, but you're not saying what you're looking for. Can we hear from one of the ones? You have to call on someone, unless someone is brave and saves all the rest of you ones. Terry. <laughs> uh, I, just, I said one because you're knowingly know, looking at reviews and reading things about something you're specifically seeking out. Yeah, I agree with Terry. This is an explicit form of feedback and data. We're very clearly saying the type of restaurant that we want to receive recommendations about. We're very explicitly telling this system what we think about this given preference for the purposes of receiving additional content. Now, one trend we'll notice throughout these examples is it may not be super easy. And that'll be part of the wrap up of this section. But before that, another one. Tinder. Explicit, implicit. So you're giving definitive feedback to the system to provide you with other recommendations. Some people are not playing anymore, they saw me calling someone. <laughs> Your finger's really high in the air. Why do you say what? Yep. Yeah, and he had to make it about looks. I don't know how he did that. But yeah, uh, I agree. This is a, another form of explicit feedback. Conditional upon us believing Tinder is using that data for the purposes of recommendation, of course. But uh, I think it's safe to assume that we know they take into account location and past preferences and so forth to serve up new recommendations. And you explicitly say zero or one. It's very easy. Slides go. All right, good work. Engagement metrics. So here I just have like a graph of how often users engage with my given site. Explicit, implicit. People are more confident about this one. I don't think I see a single one. I agree. Implicit. Why do we know it was implicit? We're incredibly confident on this one. You already spoke. Yeah. Um, but they don't know they're being tracked, basically. Yeah, yeah. They may not know they're being tracked, but being given, I agree. Even more concise, a user doesn't recognize they're giving a uh, feedback for the purpose of receiving additional content. The user is giving us feedback just via their user session. How long they've been logged in, if they click through to a given Profile, things that were served up to the user, and then they implicitly told us, did they like that content or did they not like that content? Implicit feedback is incredibly powerful. 
It's everywhere. User logs, Wi-Fi logs, session times. If you have a mobile, if you have a web application, you should be recording your implicit feedback about what works and what doesn't work. In fact, one of the core things, development a bit, in product development is recognizing when you are building a product and identifying where in the user funnel people are dropping off. So for example, you release some application. And at the top of the funnel, a user hears about that application. And you can confirm it just by they were visiting your site. Second part of the funnel, user downloads the application. Third part of the funnel, user creates an account. Fourth part of the funnel, user is a daily or monthly active user, depending on how you measure. Maybe you go monthly, then daily. If you're Facebook, you don't launch on Stanford's campus until you have 15% of daily active users on Harvard's campus, which is nuts. And then the last bit of the funnel is recommendation links. So the thing about implicit feedback is we could see where users are dropping off our given products. Did they download the application, but then they didn't create an account? They didn't explicitly say that account creation was too difficult, but they implicitly told us that there was a large barrier there because we saw the percentage of users that didn't make it past that part of the funnel. Implicit feedback. Starring songs on Spotify. Explicit, implicit. Why did you say two? It might be implicit because Spotify is noting the songs that we are listening to more and uh, streaming. And then she also says it could be explicit in that if we say this is a good song to us, this is a thumbs up, this is a star, that seems to be explicit. And you cover both sides of it. You save your peers. <laughs> it's kind of both. The starring action itself is explicit, sure, but when we talk about user logs, we talk about the number of plays added to the playlist, things like that kind of blur the line. And this one is supposed to be a both situation. Spotify itself, of course, takes advantage of both. The starring itself, we can say, is explicit. But listening and receiving recommendations is equally implicit. And so there, I kind of shifted the goalposts on us. I'm talking about the product as a whole, but for good reason. The point is to demonstrate how there's not often a single way in which we're soliciting feedback. That's important. That's one of our key takeaways. User sessions. Well, I went on a rant about this one. I hope, hope we get this one. Explicit or implicit? Yeah, if, if you said one, why are you here? No, I'm just kidding. It's, in, it's implicit. We're not having a user explicitly tell us, yes, I'm still enjoying this, yes, I'm still enjoying this, yes, I'm still enjoying this. Their presence on our site tells us that. OK, so that was a fun exercise. Let's distill what we learned, and then I'll tell you what we learned. What did we learn? What is a takeaway? We need to track engagement metrics. We need to track engagement metrics. Agreed. Yes, yes, he says video slash track both implicit and explicit engagement with our users. Why? Yeah. John. Uh, to be aware of their explicit things and not have a bias in them. If people know it's being used for their explicit things, they can kind of gain the system. Yeah, 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 yeah. We cross validate. We cross validate. We verify, we verify one form of feedback via the other. Right? And so that's the key takeaway here is while there's two different types, a, su a successful recommendation engine should be taking advantage of both. Maybe not every part of the product is taking advantage of both, but if you're building explicitly a recommendation-based product, you better be. So here's a bunch of text, and that's great. You'll have the slide deck later. But the takeaway here is what we just discussed. The reason that users 
review things, or the reason that users discuss, engage, are codependent. And we should verify, for example, that someone clicks an article. They must have liked it. No, their session time was three seconds. Right? So someone, someone adds the playlist. Someone gives a thumbs up. But then every single time that song comes on again, they skip it. Right? So we need to verify. We need to verify the type of engagement we're receiving. All right. Now that we have the data bit out of the way, now that we know the data types we're going to be dealing with, we can consider the engine we're going to be building. See how I said engine there? It's more exciting. There's two types, collaborative filtering and content-based filtering. And we're going to play another game, sorry. Uh, it's not as mean, though. Uh, it's just shadow dancers. I want to know, well, first, let me, let me at least give you some hints. There's a couple approaches to design and recommendation engine, right? In content-based filtering, items are mapped into a feature space. And then we try to align similarly matched items or users to similarly mapped content in a single vector for those that are algebraic, linear, algebraically inclined. In contrast, collaborative filtering is users who have similar preferences and matching users with similar preferences to users with similar preferences. How many dimensions? How many dimensions of data is that? Is that the question? It depends. It depends. Um, a minimum of how many? How about that? The first one is a single mapping of content to a feature space. The second one relies on Yeah, users and items. We have at least two dimensions in our feature space. It's not just the not just the content, and it's not just the user similarity. It's users and content. So you gotta think of that like a table. Okay. Amazon. Content based or collaborative. Both. Both. A lot of both. Some content. I want to hear from you. Who, who's saying both? Who's saying content? Who's saying collaborative? Saying collaborative? So the predominant. predominant you raise your hand for both, but not for both. Not for both. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Nice. The. Yeah, you're right, the answer is both because we're going to discuss hybrid systems. But I'd rather, for the purposes of learning about the differences, tease out which part is which. So, when we're discussing this specific slide, books recommended to nerds, uh, this one is pretty content specific. Amazon has pegged this user as a nerd. And this nerd is getting content recommended to them based on code interviews, algorithms, machine learning stuff, algorithm design. And the common features here is that we have a lot of content that is very similar to itself. And so the example that I have behind me is very much content specific. Right? In other words, this could be only, this picture could be only content-based filter. Can someone walk me through how we can make it collaborative? Yeah. You could look at this particular user and correlate what that person has clicked on and viewed, has purchased, etc., and then match that against other users who have clicked on, viewed, purchased other content types and begin to build correlation between the two or three or five or ten, right? Oh, we're on the agree. So he says. The two dimensions are first, we have this content stuff. But what if we had not only this content stuff, but users that have also engaged in similar content? In other words, he's taking our first vector of content and adding in users' feedback on that content. And so now it's not just a question of how similar is this content to itself and content similar to content I've bought, but how similar is this content to 
the content and to other users that got the content like me. Right? And so, for example, while all these are similar, perhaps people that only like the first two only like this last one as well. Theoretically. In that world, if we then said, we looked at how users liked things, like specific content, and we matched that to other users with similar content, then we may weed out some of the content-specific stuff that doesn't match with users that also like that content. Right? Okay. Netflix. We'll be talking about them more later in a second. Yeah. So what was the answer? So what was the answer to the question? The question? We could make it. Could make it. We could make it. We could make it. Only, only content. Only, only served. Only served. So let's say I saw that ad and bought a graphic device, and. You're going to serve content that's most similar to Cracky the Coding Interview to me. So an algorithm's textbook is very similar to Cracky the Coding Interview. They're both about algorithm design and introductions to computer science. I can make that matching determination based solely on the content of those two things being similar. Nothing about how users reacted to that content. So you mean those things collaborate? They're the same? Well, we're going to say both is a hybrid approach, and we'll talk more about it in a second. The reason for that is because, in this example, while we know that one dimension is our content, the other dimension is our users, we can have only matching users to users. That's also correct. Yes. Okay, so Netflix. We have a similar story going on. Yeah, why? Yeah. Yeah. So he says, content wise, we could be having all comedies. But Netflix also bases their recommendations not just based on the content. This is a comedy, this is a comedy. But users that, think about it, comedies is a large feature space in and of itself. Users that like this specific comedy, 50 First States, probably don't like any other movies because it's a terrible movie. But users that like Anchorman, may also like something like Tropic Thunder. And so, <laughs> the, sorry if I found your favorite The answer that it's a hybrid, and the way in which you explained it is why it's correct. But we could have, last time we talked about doing content only, this time we'll talk about doing collaborative only, which actually we have more slides on in a sec, but just to preface it. If we based it only on my user features, things about me, and not about the matching anything about the content, think about it like this. I gave five stars to Anchorman, to like Silence of the Lambs, and man, Finding Nemo. Netflix is going to have a hard time matching content based on a weirdo like me, but they might be able to find other weirdos. And in doing so, that one weirdo that really likes Silence of the Lambs and Finding Nemo, he's going to get that movie one. The example there is clear. If we base it just on users, the content can be irrelevant. Okay. So here's like a examples of each of each time, each each type of things. And here, what I want to focus on is Last FM versus Pandora. Okay? Because these are a great head-to-head -head example. They both play music for you. But the ways in which they source that music are opposite in terms of our approaches. Okay? Pandora, anyone heard of the Music Genome Project? Yeah, Pandora relies on the Music Genome Project, which is a supervised tag system of all music in existence. 
that's the goal. And we can identify what the genes of music is like. That's content based. And if Pandora is based on matching based on that given station, you created, I don't know, Snow Patrol station, then you're going to get other alt rock. Last FM, on the other hand, just looks at, well, predominantly looks at what other users that created curated stations listen to. So you have this nice head to head where they're both going to provide us music, but one of them is going to provide us music just based on that music, Music Genome Project matching, whereas the other, Last FM, is going to be based on the users and the music that they curated for their given stations. So imagine Last FM, you know, they got 500,000 users, we'll say, and we know, based on 500,000 users, what other things new users to our system are going to like. And there I'm hinting at a problem with collaborative based filter that we'll uncover in a minute. But I want to do a bit of a deeper dive into content base, just to be sure that we, we clearly see and flush out what this is. We already have a pretty good overview. How are you doing? So we have content base. As I said, content based filtering maps each item into some feature space. And we each have we have one vector for everything that we map. We don't have a table. Okay? And then we're gonna match the two together. In fact, we're gonna run through some examples. we look at the dot product between user preferences and content. And I was told that for every equation you include, you lose half your audience. So that's all we're here. Unless you don't like multiplication. Then, yes. Okay. Okay. So we have these movies that are tagged already, okay? The importance of this setup is these, this content was pre-tagged. Just like the Music Genome Project tagged our songs for us, IMDB tagged this for us, okay? And our features are big box office, aimed at kids, famous actors. So find Nemo, big box office for sure, aimed at kids, famous actors, kind of. Okay. Mission Impossible, not so kid friendly. You're referring to sushi, not even big up box office. How do you hear about that from your friend? Like, I literally need to. Okay, now let's take some user. Or a couple users, maybe. And we'll start with Alice. Remember, I said we're doing that dot product thing to match this user to whatever content we want to give them? Well, given that we're multiplying vectors, it's pretty straightforward. We're going to take Alice, who we've determined this about her preferences. This is her vector preference. And we know those things about uh, finding Nemo. And so our prediction for Alice, just with a simple top product, five times negative three summed with five times two, summed with two times negative two. Our recommendation for Alice for finding Nemo is negative nine. Ever see that? Super straightforward. The important things isn't that you saw the multiplication, it's that you recognize this content, this content tagging was given to us. And these preferences, we know about Alice. Perhaps you fill out a profile or something. We're going to do the same thing for Mission Impossible, which you find would be a really bad fit for Alice. We're going to do the same thing. Here and there. What do we select? What do we select? Thank you. I need the color. Okay. Bob, same story. Dot products. Result. Select the highest. Mission Impossible. 
Pretty simple, right? We have some content. We know features about that content. We have some users. We know their feelings about that type of content. Multiply together. What's the highest? Bam, prediction. Note that we would have a prediction for every user, even if it's a terrible prediction. We always have a highest value. We always have something to say. At least one value is greater or equal to all the rest of the values, in which case we're different. So I talked about Pandora already, um, but I want to hammer home the idea. They use the Music Genome Project. We have these song vectors. And based on a user selecting some station, that tells us things about that user's preferences, thought products, here's a song. What is a big potential, actually kind of is, disadvantage with content-based recommendation engines? Yeah? It's only as good as the categorization. It's only as good as the categorization, which presupposes what? What's that? That you know everything about your users. That you know everything about your users. That you can't categorize at all. What's that? That you can even categorize. That you can even categorize at all. These are all correct answers. And they're dependencies on each other. Would it also assume that you only prefer one type of content? In an absolute sense, but we can know, like the Mission Impossible example, there are still two that were positive. So we hit on a key problem with content-based filtering. And that is, it assumes we have not only accurately tagged content, accurate user information, but content at all, right? Imagine if the Music Genome Project didn't start, or it wasn't a thing. Pandora can't exist, as it does now, right? So we have this huge ask where we need this tagged data. We need tagged data to be able to assign it to users. Let's keep that in the back of our heads. There's the other things about it. Another one that we didn't really mention too explicitly, it's hard to create cross-content recommendations for the same reason that maybe we have a bunch of books tagged, but we don't have a bunch of music tagged. Whereas if we're measuring by the user level, then if we know that user's preferences across a variety of spaces, as long as we're matching to the user, we can still make a good recommendation. Okay. Let's do a deep dive into collaborative filtering. So collaborative filtering, we refer to these methods where we predict ratings instead of thinking about users and items in terms of feature space, we are only interested in existing user ratings themselves. This is what I've been hammering home about. We just need to know things about one user. And here's our formal definition about that. And because of that, we have these ideas. Now, I think, I think we're prepared to discuss some main differences in these systems. Can someone name one? Or the exact same? Between content and collaborative? Yes. I have a notion of collaborative filtering as something that pertains to things to what is everybody what, what is the what is what is the what is the as opposed to those two any personal any preference by our eyes anything any it's more it's more slower so if I know that this is highly rated restaurant and this is highly rated school highly rated Yeah, so. I personally had something to do with Yeah, you bring up a good point. He says that we may arrive at just the most popular choice. If we're just basing it on users, imagine like when a movie opens, the box office goes nuts. A bunch of users, or people, went to the movie theater. Users are people. Users are people. <laughs> and those people had opinions about that movie. And if we had a bunch of people do that, 
his point is that our collaborative filtering is going to be like the equivalent of saying the most popular thing. Kind of true. Consider the following. Is that bad? Is this filter good enough? It's terrible. Yeah. Like it's popular within my subpopulation. Right. Right. So that's what I wanted to that's what I wanted to get at. If we are relatively confident that users that's only a problem if we're not confident that users are relatively similar to begin with. If the users are very similar, then yeah, maybe they both do want to go to popular films. Perhaps that's one of the features they like that it's a big box office film. And actually the advantage is that even way, while that is a really good thought about driving a global answer, that doesn't mean that we can't get to the, the long tails of recommendation. As in, users that have very odd specific preferences, like that movie person I listed earlier, if we had people with very specific preferences, sure it's harder to, harder to find than matches. But that doesn't mean we would be limited in making a good recommendation. In fact, we might be very empowered because if that user has very categorically odd opinions, then content-based approaches are going to fit. Um, what are some other big differences? Is the type of data needed for each approach that different? Yeah, yeah, great. He says the types of data we need are disparate. Content is content. We care about tagging items, we care about user genome projects, we care about knowing what this book is about. Collaborative, we need to know things about users. users. And, and in fact, and in fact, in fact that, will raise, that will raise a problem for us. Probably really lose earlier. But let me just throw up our slide about our differences. The main big idea. We're mapping users into a single feature space, a single thing about how they feel about the box, whatever, whatever. And we're using that as a vector. Collaborative rely on previous user ratings. I want to focus on that. Collaborative relies on previous user ratings. They don't see a problem with that. A couple people do. A lot of people do. I want someone that hasn't spoken yet, though. Yeah. So you have to have an ever-progressing data set as you get new content. So as new music comes out, new movies come out, movies come out. That data set zero, you're not going to have any ratings. And then as that's been out longer, it's been out longer and you create. Yeah. Uh, in other words, scalability. Yeah. It's going to be tough. You can be that guy that sits in the meeting and just raises his hand halfway through and goes, does it scale? And you'd be valid, raise your valid point. Good job, business scale guy. The volume of information that we have to deal with in terms of making these recommendations about our user data grows at the rate of our users. What else? It's hard to scale, you're right. Yeah? This is kind of like what you were saying earlier. Like, um, so, yeah, content based. Content based. Like, the two books on. Organic farming, organic farming. You can look at it and see yeah. that they're both yeah. on, both on, like objectively both job and both on or whatever. Um, but then, um, then the collaborative thing that, that I was wondering about, was wondering about was, um, um, I mean, are you basically treating like you know, I think with you have like big big actors and the content base, the content base, the ones we that don't actually have. Yeah. So, so. Yeah, like there's no yeah, like, dispute that there's, there's factors that's kind of pegged to someone like they like big actors, do they like do they like um, uh, I'm forgetting the other two, but the one in the other sure. one. Sure. Uh, my question is like my question like um, uh, are you basically assuming those are gonna be those factors that there's no interaction interaction, you know, um, uh, independence between what? Well so like George Clooney, right? Like George Clooney was in Syrian, which I mean he's a huge actor and he's a Generally regarded as like a good movie, and someone could like that movie. But then George Clooney was also in Batman, which I don't know if they weren't running that, but 
was the best bat the best bat. So it's like, so it's like you know, you know, the interaction between the interaction between 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 big actor and the nature of the movie, I guess. Yeah, so, yeah. How do you really? Yeah, the, in a content-based approach? Uh, or either in collaborative. Well, let's talk through that. So the, the question is, we have an actor playing a very different role in two different movies. Are we going to make bad recommendations because one person likes that actor? And like a lot of things, the answer is it depends, but let me explain how. If we have other features in addition to actors that this person likes as a bit of the content, then perhaps we can still make a pretty good recommendation. But if we're highly dependent on actor, an actor is just one of two content-based features, then yeah, we would recommend a totally different movie. Probably going to care about genre, I don't know, but the point is that you raise a good design question about what factors we should match on. Um, now let's talk about that in the collaborative approach, because that's where I want to shift our discussion here for a second. Because we haven't uncovered, what we've discovered, the, the does it scale question, there's something else. How's it going to gain traction? Can you unpack that? Well, because it's relying on user input, it, it means you're, you can't, it, the users aren't inputting anything, it's not going to gain traction at all. Yeah, yeah. The relies on user input. In other words, what if you're the first one on the product? What do you recommend me? to me? And that's where I want to take this discussion. That's called the cold start problem. You have nothing to go off of. And that's because we rely on ratings and feedback from our users to make recommendations to our other users. Right? It's a dramatically difficult place to be. If we don't have any users in our system, how can we make a recommendation based on users in our system? That's the most simple way to think about it. And so, I spoiled the lead. We can get around this by some bits of implicit feedback, which might include item browsing behavior, or you know, user sessions, things like that. We can get around it like that, knowing that even if we don't know this user's ratings of this restaurant, if this user spent a lot of time looking at Persian food, potentially they like Persian food, um, things like that can help. Uh, but this is why we really rely on hybrid approaches. Because if we can have content that's tagged to solve our cold start problem, and a collaborative approach where we listen to our users and we learn what those users like best, then we may just have a silver bullet of a solution. I just had a question. Um, in design, do you ever so like specifically here, like would you ever um, you know, use someone's like geolocation or the browser that you're using? For example, if someone's um, coming from uh, like you can tell they're coming from California and not that. I mean, you know You're asking a data scientist, would you use data available? Yeah, right. <laughs> well I yes. guess I guess to say, you know, at that point like I mean it's you know, probably a sure bet they're probably not a Trump, yeah. Trump voter, right? Like, yeah. so you would, before they give you anything, I guess you could yeah. use Yeah, that. even if someone, unless someone's smoothing their IP and using a proxy, in other words, they're a scraper, then we know their IP address, and that tells us a fair amount of information already. You're right. Uh, so the point is, we now understand that we can glean lots of information without a single rating. That's valuable. But what's important here is the reason we are seeing these hybrid approaches is precisely because each have limitations that conveniently balance one another. Right? So content's really great, but we don't know things across products. Collaborative is really great, but we don't know things in the beginning. So now we're going to start. Where are we now? Where are we now? We know about data types. We know about, we know about, types. We know about how to get information from users. We know about different types of recommendation engines. We know about the contrasting of the two. We need to find similarity. We went through one example with content based, but I want to introduce another type of similarity.
What is similarity anyway? Likeness. Likeness, yeah. Can we break that down in a way that would allow us to say how likeness two things are? I don't disagree, but it's often a taken for granted principle. Yeah. I mean, you can take a one approach and determine what your attributes are that would identify sameness and then measures the uh, number of attributes that match across the two elements. Yes. 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 yes, to find your similarity. Sweet. 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 So we're going to find similarity between two sets of objects. And we're going to see how much similarity there is versus how much difference there is. Just a very terse approach to similarity. Obviously, at this point, if we're data scientists or at least have worked in some applied statistics, we recognize that there's other methods we can use. Regressions or supervised learning techniques, you know, support vectors, whatever. There's a model you can use to solve this process too. But that's beyond the scope of what we care about tonight. We just care about some way to get similar. In fact, the lecture that's coming up in like two weeks is about deep learning, which is a way to determine similarity, of course. There's a host of models. So we care about the number of things that the two have in common versus the number of things that these two things have differently. Intersections and unions. So there you go. Number of similar elements and the union of all the elements. And in the in the horse. Now In this example, we have two sets, and we're looking at how many of those things are similar between those two sets, and how many of those things are different between those two sets. So we have set A, one, two, three, set B, two, three, four. How many of those things are similar? Two and three. How many different elements do we have? Four. So what's our similarity? Oh, I took out the answer slide, that's good. Yeah. This one has the answer slides here. Okay. User one likes Target, Banana Republic, and Old Navy. User two, Banana Republic, Gap, Coles. How similar are these users? According to your card similarity. How similar are these users? How many things do they have in common? How many things are different? The total number of the union the union. Not how many, sorry, how many are different is a poor way of saying it. How many different items we have available to us is a better way of saying it. Five. Yeah. So we have five different things, and one of them is similar. Nice. <laughs> Bless you. Okay, so now we have a very terse way of determining similarity. We have data types. We know what type of engines we can build. So we can build a recommendation engine. So that's what we're going to do. But first, the Netflix prize. A quick divergence of fun. Who's heard of the Netflix prize? Who heard of this, heard of this problem before? Yeah. The Netflix prize was uh, announced in, I think, originally it was six when Netflix wanted to have someone improve their matching algorithm, okay? So they did this in rounds, and they awarded rewards at those rounds, and they saw who was doing well at this round, well at this round, and then the final round. And in fact, the teams merged and came together, and this is a funny thing. And at the end, in 2009, one team won by increasing the Netflix matching algorithm by 10%, as compared by root mean squared error. And they used over 107 different algorithms and won a million dollars for it. Netflix did not implement this algorithm that was 10% better than anything their engineers could come up with. Why? Or is our doesn't scale good? <laughs> Scalability. The ease with which you could implement something that's so monstrous just to get a single 
recommendation increase. The engineering fee, the cost, the implementation simply did not outweigh the benefit of having a 10% better match. And Netflix cited some business interest reasons as to why they didn't want to have the Netflix prize uh, given out, or sorry, just looking at the money, but implemented that year. And then they offered to do it again, and they released too much user sensitive data, and they canceled it, and it was really out. Netflix buys it now. Okay. Now, why? Why? So, I promised I'd tell you guys how we did this with wine. And I thought I should first tell you how you do it at all. The, I don't know much about movies either, either actually. Um, so, why? We now know the steps required. We need to get some data, determine our recommendation system, and test. Right? So I'm going to walk you through this, this saga of how this, how this works. And this part is much less, there's zero equations. Um, it's just, just a story. So the French Embassy has this award where they want to spread French culture. And I'm looking at it, and I'm seeing the ways in which they want to promote French culture in the United States. And I'm like, things I don't know a lot about French culture. Things I do know a fair amount about data. So I was like, all right, I believe that with successful data science, we don't need to know anything about anything. And I'm going to pitch them on building a recommendation engine with wine. And so I record this video of me with these wine bottles behind me talking about how I'm going to build this great thing and how I'm mispronouncing or probably mispronouncing these words. And it's a minute long, so it's amazing I can mispronounce anything in a bit. And submit it. And I wait and hear back. And then we hear back from them. And they're like, hey, that's awesome. We're going to hook you up with Kickstarter. We're going to hook you up with some funds to make this happen. We're going to do a whole thing about it. I'm like, all right. Now I need to figure out how to do it. Didn't realize that it would go this far. And so we have, we stage this hackathon, and we have a bunch of developers come, and they all show up. And the way we organized it is we had some French culture experts, some data scientist types, and some software developer types. And we all get into this room, it smells like roast pizza, people haven't showered, and we stay there for way too long. And we need to get some data. And we don't have any data, which is important actually. And so we look around for data sources. We end up on wine.com, and it would be a violation of their terms of service to scrape wine.com. So we didn't scrape wine.com, but got all the data on French, French wines. It's recorded, remember? And with that data, we have 500 wine varieties with five features on each. We have the name of the wine. We have the price, the great varietal, whatever that means, popularity, and the critic score. And we're like, okay, doing good. Five hours in, got some data. Then we realize, I want to match based on users. Turns out we didn't have any users. And we didn't have any wine to test either. So things went from bad to worse. And I realized the harsh reality of the cold start problem, and how we needed some tagged data on this wine to match. So for example, we knew the grape varietal, but we didn't know what that grape varietal went well with. I mean, I knew like white meats and red meats, but that's not a very good recommendation. And so, uh, lo and behold, a friend of mine named Michael um, happens to be a software developer that used to work in a Michelin star kitchen. He's probably the only one in DC like this. And he's like, yeah, yeah, no, I, uh, I know tons of ones. Um, and he starts tagging some content. And so the whole hackathon comes to the screeching hall waiting for Michael to tag some content. And so he's like tagging some of these wines, and he's figuring out which ones go well with which great varietals. We're all on like Vivino.com. We're on like, uh, it's great, I don't, I don't even remember the, the data source of like these infographics of how to like pair wine from beginners. And all this stuff, trying to tag this content and try to figure it out. And then we have some tagged data. And so we're like, all right, we can build a content-based approach. There's like three hours left in Hackathon, we don't have a friend. And so we focus on turning this content-based approach 
into something that looks usable. Because it's important that we had some deliverable after the, the end of this hackathon. And even if we have this pre tech data, we have some ways to make recommendations, it's important that we have something to, to show for it. And so we trained the data, and we just matched on basic similarity, which killed me because I was like, man, there's so many models we can do, there's so many things. But remember, it doesn't need to be perfect, just, just good enough. It just needs to be useful. It doesn't need to be right. You guys are like, I don't want to write recommendations from this guy. <laughs> and so we matched with similarity, as we showed a few slides back. And we built a front end, and then we present it to the MC like two weeks later. And we show them, and it's this static site that can't take user feedback and iterate on that user feedback. It's non-collaborative, but it has this content-based approach. And if you're a first-time user, and you're coming to a site for the first time, as a first-time user, first time on the site, you don't know if it's collaborative or not. And so we demonstrate this, this content-based system, and they gave us one look. So uh, that was good. But now we're going to have this predicament where we need user feedback on the pairings that we're recommending. We need to deploy to a more scalable solution given that we're going to be relying on this user feedback. We touched on that. We need users. And that's, a, that's kind of a separate discussion about where, where this direction goes. But um, over the purpose of promoting this thing and, and talking about it, things like this, we have some AWS engineer, like TweetSafe in Arizona, that wants to scale it, and blah, blah, blah. Point is, if this interests you, we have work to be done. Um, secondly, we, our team is much better at building models better than just similarity. Like they killed me to just do it based on similarity. Like the thing I teach is like a bunch of different models, and here I am just subtracting similarities. And the last bit is, um, if you want to talk about this thing, then we should talk. We'll do Q&A in a second. But amazingly, after that performance, the French embassy is like, this guy gets it. So we're hosting another hackathon. And this time we're getting the data ahead of time. And we are going to identify, so the embassy is concerned that fewer and fewer individuals are choosing to study in France. And so they're going to give us five years of backlog data on individuals and opting to study in France or not. And they want us to identify the ideal student who wants to study abroad and the ideal destination for that student to study abroad. So that you could predict which resources should be spent where. So we're planning this hackathon. It'll be at General Assembly on December 4th. And I hope I you all to sign up or at least hear a bit about it, but no worries if not. Good way to learn, good way to meet people, good way to get some probably wine. The winners, uh, we're working on some kind of cool prize. It might be like a dinner from the chef at the embassy. It's always like a Michelin star chef. Cool stuff like that. Um, but that aside, you should come out. In addition, you heard about the Michelin thing that we did. Uh, I will also be making this into like a contest again. So if you want to compete, well, who you guys compete. Um, and the last thing is I have to thank David Yarrington, who is a data science friend and GA colleague based in San Francisco who helped me come up with those movie examples. Um, so big thanks to him. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, GitHub, Joseph Viola, any of that. But without that, uh, I welcome your questions. Thank you.
Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I lean towards complex models, though complex is a bit relative. In other words, if we just did like even a classification with a logistic regression, which would scale pretty well, I bet that would meet the null of just doing it based on matches, and it still would scale across our, our system quite nicely. And I would hardly consider a logistic regression complex, for example. Maybe the best thing for this would be naive Bayes, because we'd have a lot of out-of-sample observations that we don't know anything about, but we know some of the things that those users like. I don't know, but that, that's what I'm intrigued in doing. I like model selection and validation techniques. Yeah. So, I'm Rob Colenzo. I work at Total Line more, so we should talk. Uh, uh, question. Question. Uh, uh, do you think uh, as you guys were exploring this uh, from a user interface perspective, specific to drive the sort of drive the piece, did you think about think about creating sort of creating application elements to, to drive to user right. engagement to begin getting that sort of user side data set? Yes. So I mean, as you can tell, I think incredibly product centric, for better or for worse. I call people users today. The um, the space between a user-facing application for wine recommendations is very small between what Vivino does and what you actually need. For, so for example, Vivino, you can take a photo of a wine label and get the gradients across the entire community, just based on image recognition. That's powerful. We think the way that we would productionize this is going to inventories themselves and integrating with their point of sale systems. Um, but we haven't found if there's a single, if there's a common point of sale system with an API or if there's a lot of different ones. Obviously, it's not going to scale very well to integrate with every individual one. Value being, if a user buys wine from a given wine shop and you give them recommendations only from that place's inventory, you've completed, you've you've created a sticky relationship between users going back to that one wine shop, that one wine shop benefiting on getting that user, and then even smarter, you, the builder of that app, have every wine preference throughout that region, and that's valuable for BI reasons independent of building user relationships. Yeah. The question is, what actually is the reason we're collaborating? And we don't have a given right. right. user. Right. What do we do in that basis? What do we do in that basis? I mentioned a few mentioned small, tactics, few small tactics, like basing on user sessions or basing just on um, the few things that they've clicked on, maybe items they've viewed in their cart. Of course, this is incredibly context specific, depending on what your thing is. But what's very common is just to do things like most common items. In other words, if we can find a recommendation based on collaborative. Top preference. Else, most popular. Uh, and then anything beyond that depends on how how improved you can take into account other implicit feedback, like I noted a second ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what was the total development time for you guys? That was my first question. When I was the second one was. Um, so I used to work for a firm, so they were pulling stuff from um, the DNC servers. And yeah. 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 Um, and they were basically building like voter profiles, uh, and they had, I mean, it must have been at least like seven or eight hundred metrics. On, yeah. On yeah. Person. So how many metrics did you guys actually use? Yeah. Uh, in the final. Um. So I'll take this last question for, for all of us, but I've seen people streaming out, so I don't want to keep everyone captive, or if you guys want to be kept in the loop on the future French stuff, you can sign up and, and do that thing before you before you leave. I'll answer this question globally, and then every other question, let's just come up here. Uh, how many different features did we base it on? We based it on the five features that we had available that we had So how similar this one is based on critic, popularity, price. And then we also enabled a user to filter by those three features. So yeah, you have how similar these two lines are and given a user preference. So the way we took user preference, remember it relies on two things, user preference and the lines. We had the lines tag, but we didn't have user preference. We had the user fill out a survey of what they were eating that night and like what they wanted to eat that night. Big plate, small plate, white meat, red meat, whatever. Based on those, we had some tagged content, but went well with those things. 
on those five features. So you know, red and white is a very good determinant feature. Uh, we find frustrations with, you'll note that Jacquard's similarity assumes that every feature is of equal importance. In the context of the line, that doesn't make sense. Reds just simply don't go with some fields. And so we found the like, frustrations associated with, with this approach. Um, uh, let's, if you have other questions, why don't you come forward? And like I'll take them individually. And then if you just simply want to be up to date on like competitions that I do, or I send out this weekly email of data events going on in DC, like this one, um, and cool data sets and things to be learning, because I'm all about making the Python community grow, then I welcome you to come sign up for that. But beyond that, thank you all for coming tonight, and hoping to meet some of you guys now. Thank you for coming. You're welcome.